Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for August 25th, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly webcast and podcast is our opportunity to talk about all things organizing, and we get topic ideas and go searching for things that you care about and all the comments that you make on our channels. We really appreciate that you do that, and I am doing my best to keep up, but y'all are getting really commenty and I'm in trouble keeping up with all the comments now. We've also been working hard reviewing chat transcripts of previous webcasts to make sure we're covering all the bases we need to cover and we have a list of topics a mile long that we're sorting through <laughs> to put together right. future episodes. If you're joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to something else. And you can also use your raise hand to feature to let me know if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming live on Facebook, so you can post questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast every Tuesday, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. Okay, Gail, let's get to our show. We're going to okay, start okay. with follow-up to a previous topic, last week's topic of books and magazines. Eileen, who was with us in Zoom last week and is here again today, said cooking and DIY books can be a terrible trap bought because we hope to do all that cooking or those projects but then if we don't we feel guilty then we hang onto the books and torture ourselves and so uh <laughs> that was a great comment that we didn't get to last week and yeah. so we want to just expand on that a little bit to circle back and say yeah you don't know how many times i've gone into clients houses and found organizing for dummies, how to get organizing, magazines about storage and all kinds of books, hoping that reading the book was going to be the magic fix to getting organized. And this applies to all kinds of projects where we think, if I just look at a book, I'm going to suddenly start cooking or I'm going to suddenly start fill in the blank. And so I had a whole series of, I think they were one of the tool brands Gosh, I can't remember which one, but a whole series of mm. home, home improvement project books. Yeah, like how to fix the plumbing books. Yeah, and I thought they were going to turn me into a responsible homeowner who enjoyed doing <laughs> things like that. I was and that so was wrong. No. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very wrong. Right, but it is our, you know, typical first place if you don't know something about it you go looking for a book and hope that that's going to inspire you or teach you or make it happen and it's not always true and i think that if you buy those books with all those good intentions baked in and then you discover that indeed this isn't really your uh, bailiwick and you really do need to pay someone else to do the plumbing instead of trying to do it yourself um it is the perfect thing to apply the it's our artists, our artist concept of what the top 50% is most appealing versus the less appealing. So in, in the craft environment, I talked about it last time too, that the idea that if you, if you find all things in the world appealing, or if you find all books in the world appealing, <laughs> they're all appealing, but they're on a scale of what is interesting to you. And so if you, recognize that you can't realize or make use of or read or craft with or what fill in the blank here this concept if you can't do all the things it, that fall into your cone of interest let's say then you should aim for the stuff that is at the upper half the upper 50 percent of the stuff the stuff that is the most interesting to you versus the things that are less interesting to you and so in this environment of cooking or DIY or self-help comes to mind, the kinds of books that you buy because you may or may not be trying to add an interest or improve a skill or whatever, and you don't find that the books really help, then <clears throat> put them in that scale and say, do I find this 
at the, my upper area of interest, the upper 50% of my interest, or is it in the lower category? And if it falls into the lower category, then let it go. Because you really don't want to be tortured by your books. You really don't want to be feeling like that book is sitting there mocking me, right? And so if the only thing that's left for the book is your guilt and the sense of mockingness by the book, then I think it's time to let it go, right? Uh, it, you just have to evaluate. You may have all kinds of good intentions, but it, it, look at it for, in a realistic way and say, am I ever going to be, become the person that goes and repairs the toilet? And the answer for me is no. I'm always going to call the plumber and because I like I don't have time for that I don't want to be dealing with that <laughs> I can't be bothered with that and so Frankie says hi by the way he's talking on his way by so I think that better to let the guilt go and let the let the stuff go and not let it sit there and mock you anymore that's the bottom line next we have a question this one came from Genevieve on YouTube which organizing tasks tend to go faster or slower than expected? I thought this was a particularly uh, useful question for Genevieve to ask because it talks about the baked in expectation versus reality of these projects. And so I, I have three to talk about. One of them is paper and paper and offices in general always go slower ton slower than you expect because paper is so many decisions for each piece of paper and so you have to pick up each piece of paper and go yes I want it no I don't want it and doing that process in a stack of paper that's you know 500 sheets and it's only two inches tall you spend a lot a lot of time going through and making decisions and not clearing very much space and so tackling an office or tackling any paper project really that you have a big volume of it always takes a ton longer than you expect it's going to so it's helpful to know that going in and to say you know in your head I think this uh, paper project is going to take uh, three weeks and you should just say except Gail says multiply by four like take whatever your expectation is and multiply by four and then you'll have a better uh, general idea and you can plan for that and if you end up being able to do it faster awesome but um, the reason I, I point that out is because if it goes slower than you think it's a way for you to get discouraged and feel like a failure in your organizing project and I don't want you to think that that's true it really is true instead that it takes a long time to get through paper and you should just plan on that. Another one that goes slower than we expect is a craft room and craft rooms really go slower because there's so much stuff in there, but also because we find all the stuff in there so appealing and we want to play with it all. So I know lots of crafters get distracted when they start working on their craft rooms because they start finding all this cool stuff that they forgot was there or they find all this stuff that they feel sad or embarrassed is there or I, I didn't finish that project or oh, I was going to give it to my friend or here was the project that I started for my mother and then she died and so there's there's lots of um triggers in the craft room either uh, on the fun side or on the um, negative side that slow that process down so I've started with people in craft rooms before and I look at the room and I think yeah I'm going to be here for four appointments and they look at me like I'm crazy and the truth is we pack craft rooms really really densely and we are super attracted to all the contents and so <laughs> It's, you just need to know that there's more time baked in the craft rooms than you think. One that I think is actually faster than most people expect them to be is junk rooms. And the reason that junk rooms usually go faster is because if you sort of classify it as a junk room in your head, then you throw everything in there. And what ends up happening is a lot of what in essence is trash goes in there because you don't want to deal with it in the moment or it becomes the junk room during the move when you're moving in and so then you're throwing all the things to get them out of the way so that you can get your house going and make it happen um, get back to work get back to eating that kind of stuff in the new house and so 
there's a bunch of cast offs that go into the junk room. And what that means is that there's lots of trash, there's lots of boxes, whether they're moving boxes or shipping boxes or whatever, they have lots of trash in them that, and then there'll be one little object or it'll be a box from the move that you opened and then didn't, like you got two thirds of it out, you got the easy part out and then you got to the bottom and it was the bottom third is a bunch of shrapnel that you didn't think you had time to process. And so the whole box went in. And then when you go to open the box, there's just a little bit in the bottom of it. So the junk room has a lot of sort of baked in trash and air. <laughs> that If you just go in and start pulling out the trash and pulling out the empty boxes and pulling out the empty bags and um, empty in those contents and, you'll find that the stuff that you have to process and deal with is a much smaller pile than you think. And the bigger portion of it is all the empties, the empty bags, empty boxes, the partially used boxes. And um, if you just go and pull those out, your junk drawer will, it'll sort of be like poking a hole and having the air all seep out and it'll all just go, woo. <laughs> and you'll have a much smaller pile to deal with. So um, that one, usually it goes a lot faster. It looks daunting because it looks so trashy and trash heap like, and usually it's very tall, right? Cause you're stacking all these boxes or throwing, it's gotten really, um, it's grown really tall in the room. And so it's kind of intimidating from that standpoint. But usually if you pull out the empty boxes in the trash, you will find that it's much less to deal with than you really, really think. So there, there's two slowers and one faster <laughs> for, your, for your organizing pleasure. Okay, let's get on to our featured topic. Okay. And b before I introduce it, I want to say our inboxes are usually about equally divided between people asking us to talk more about paper and people asking us to talk less about paper <laughs> right. and yet and yet our the topics we do on paper are always extremely well attended and get a lot Popular. of views on youtube so we're going to yeah. talk about paper again but this is a this is an angle that we haven't talked about in a while do you dream of a world without paper the idea of a paperless lifestyle has been around since the 1970s believe it or not when wow. Gail and I first tackled the topic in 2012, we called the presentation, Can You Really Go Paperless? In 2012, our answer was, yes, sort of, but it's going to take some work. <laughs> Many of us still struggle to avoid drowning in paper eight years later. Mm. Clutter Fairy clients often complain that there's paper everywhere in their homes. They want to get control of it, but they're frustrated about how to make that happen. The good news is that it's gotten a lot easier and less painful to manage without paper as more companies and service providers have moved their businesses to paperless or at least less paper intensive workflows. So we're calling today's episode, yes, you really can go paperless, mostly. Yes, you really can. But eight years later, there's not a single simple route to paperlessness. Since paper comes from many sources, reducing paper requires a multi-pronged solution. None of the steps are complicated, though, and each one can make a dent in the volume of paper that you have to handle every day. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get to actions you can take to reduce your paper intake, though, I want to remind you of a key distinction to keep in mind. For most people, managing paper is really two challenges. There's typically a backlog of paper that you've been accumulating for weeks or months or years in the house somewhere or your office or whatever location. That's an organizing project that's gonna take some time. We've discussed strategies for tackling your paper backlog in several previous conversations, so we're not really gonna revisit managing the big backlog paper pile today. The other challenging in managing paper is cultivating a habit to keep your paper piles from growing. The key here is, as with all clutter maintenance routines, is to dedicate enough time on a daily, semi-weekly or weekly basis to stay ahead of the influx of paper that's coming in. The tactics we're offering today will help you reduce that influx and thereby reduce the time and effort that your paper maintenance habit will require which should make everybody happier, right? If the less time you have to spend maintaining it, the better. 
Uh, we are going to refer to a few websites today and the links will be found on our website at cfhou.com slash paperless. We'll also put them in the description of the YouTube video and the podcast show notes. Uh, we should also mention here that the websites are for are basically going to be for U.S. residents. So for our international viewers and listeners, you'll need to search for equivalent resources in your country of residence. I'm sure that they are they exist, and I just can't capture them all for all countries available. So um, you should, but you should be able to Google for these concepts as websites in your own countries. Okay, so let's try some of these approaches to reduce your paper load and you'll be on your way to a more paperless lifestyle. Won't that be exciting? Number one, you can opt out of pre-screened credit and insurance offers at optoutprescreen.com. This action will stop those annoying unsolicited pre-approval letters, the fake checks that come and the debt refinancing schemes. If their algorithm algorithms decide that you're a good candidate for these letters, you'll be drowning in these things. I find these at in greater volume at particular clients. So if you are somebody who they think needs this service the most, then you will be on tons of lists and you will get repeated letters over and over and over again. It's a huge volume fire hose of refinance your debt. Here's how you get a loan. Here's how you get another credit card. It's like that is the worst possible solution if you are in that position, but they will drown you in paper to sell it to you. So uh, if you are one of those people, here's how you opt out of them so that you don't have to deal with it. <laughs> opt out and your junk mail will drop significantly, I promise. And it will be, I find those kind of letters a little, um, demeaning and guilt inducing from the people that get them because it's always, you know, you have too much debt. Don't you need to refinance? And, and I find that those letters are designed to make people feel bad. And so stop feeling bad and opt out of them and get some of the paper out of your house. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay. Number two, you can substantially reduce the rest of your other junk mail by registering yourself on the national do not mail list. So it takes a while for this change to filter into all the advertising mailing lists, but you'll see a gradual decline over several months. I did it many years ago and it really took three, four months for, uh, for me to see a drastic reduction, but I really, really did. It eventually bleeds out into everybody's, all the companies that subscribe and pull off that list. It eventually bleeds out and you stop having uh, those things appear and it, it really reduces the volume. Number three, you can eliminate particularly specifically unsolicited catalogs by signing up and opting out at catalog choice. So this is a website where you go in, you look up the company, like let's say, you know, it's, I'm drawing a blank, Walmart. Let's go to, let's assume Walmart and they're mailing out a catalog and you can go, or Costco and you can go in and say, hey, I'm getting this catalog for Walmart and you look up Walmart and then you see all the available catalogs that they have options listed. And you can, uh, you can select to not get all these kind and only get one at Christmas or get nothing from this company or whatever you want to do. So when you start getting catalogs, you can go into catalog choice, find that specific catalog and say, stop sending it to me. Again, there is some time for it to filter in the people that subs the companies have to go back to catalog choice and pull in the updates to their system. So there's a little bit of time um, evolution uh, in terms of getting you off the list, but it does work. Um, it does require that you go in and you're, you know, doing it catalog by catalog company and you, you're going in and selecting, you know, you're not just saying stop sending me catalogs, you're going in and picking specific ones. And so I find that it's a really useful if you, for instance, if you buy something online, then you immediately get signed up for the catalog unless you're really, really clever and manage to uncheck enough times and in the right sequence to get to not sign you up for their mailing list. So once you get signed up sort of 
against your will <laughs> to a bunch of uh, lists, catalogs, you can go in and say, no, no, I don't, I really don't want your catalogs and make them go away. Um, it requires a little work, but I think it's totally worth it because once you uh, take yourself off and they update their list, you will go away from their catalogs forever. And if you go and buy them again, you'll have to like try <laughs> to you know, make sure that you don't get yourself signed back up again. Okay, that's catalogs. Here's the next one. For paper items that you'd like to retain for future reference, you might want to invest in a desktop scanner. Or, and now they have, you know, cell phone versions. You can have apps that scan as well. But for a vol any kind of a volume, you probably want a scanner that is sits on your desk and attaches to your computer. So and scan Gail, the document. Yes. And, you know, if, you're, if your biggest thing is... Um, receipts if you have a like huge volume of receipts they even make dedicated receipt scanners which mm. are kind of nice because you can typically feed them a little stack and you and know they'll run, pull through, them in one through, run at a yeah, time run them, run them through in bulk yeah so you scan the documents you save them as image files or pdfs and then you can recycle or trash or shred the originals I will say that there's uh, one caveat related to scanning, which is scanning all of your paper is a bigger project than most people want to tackle. It takes just as long to scan it all and set up, a, you know, name the file and save the file somewhere as it does to go and put that document in a file folder in a filing cabinet somewhere. They're not, they're equivalent. They're just an electronic version and a paper version of filing. So scanning all your paper is not what you're aiming for here. Uh, what you're really wanting to do is concentrate your scanning on paper that you want to say permanently or papers you think you'll be referring to again. So paper that meets that criteria will be a big enough scan project for you. If you concentrate on those things first and you catch up to yourself and you're really happy <laughs> with scanning, then you come back and scan all the other stuff that you, you know, don't think is as important. But truthfully, uh, you want to concentrate scanning and use scanning as a way to electronically capture things that are important and valuable and permanent or that you need to go put your hands on again, like your tax paperwork, if you don't want to keep them in physical copy. Next option is if you're comfortable doing so, you can opt into electronic bill paying. If you have the resources and the discipline to make sure that there's always sufficient money in your bill paying account, you might also consider making automatic scheduled payments. If automatic payments work for you, you can potentially never pay a late fee again. It's worth the effort just to make sure a minimum payment is set up so you stop racking up late fees. This is like a game changer for people that struggle with paying bills on time and get punished by having late fees all the time. So if you can put the effort into creating automatic payments and at least setting up minimum payments, so a minimum payment happens, whether you're ready to make a full payment or not, this can have a really big impact on your credit rating. Uh, late payments really is a big ding in your credit rating. And so just doing this effort to get automatic payments happening will help your credit rating for sure. Worth the effort. Even if you're not ready to pay your bills online, you can switch to bank, you can switch your bank and credit card and utility accounts so that you get your bills and statements in electronic versions through the email instead of your mailbox. So even if you still want to write a check and mail a check away, that's not a problem. You can still get the statements electronically to the email. So then it's not paper in the house and you don't have to try to find where the bill went when it's time to bill, to find the bill and pay it. Um, having it come to the inbox means that it's there as long as you don't delete the email. If you're nervous about relying on websites to maintain your data, and some people are like, yeah, yeah, they're keeping my statements, but what if they go out of business? So if that makes you nervous, then you can get those versions and generate a PDF version of it. So you can get your, you're going to get your bill and statement reference from the company in an email and it's going to be a click and you go out to the web to their website and see the statement and then you can turn it into a pdf and if you do that then you'll be able to print a paper copy of it anytime you want without having to go back to the website and you don't have to worry about it once you have an, a pdf which is basically an electronic version of the statement then you have that pdf and you 
don't have to worry about what happens to the company, right? You still have a copy of the statement. So all Mac and Windows laptop and desktop computers offer the option of saving documents or web pages as PDFs. And all of the major smartphone operating systems support saved PDF features either uh, natively or through uh, apps that are not, they're either free or really inexpensive. And so there are all kinds of ways for you to capture any kind of electronic file that you're linked to a statement somewhere out at another company. You can capture it as a PDF and then you don't have to worry about it and you still don't have to have the paper. Right? <laughs> Gail, Rejoice asked, is there a scanner app, especially for iPhone OS, that can scan address labels and in a perfect world offer the option to add it to your contacts. I'm using the notes app to scan, but it just stays in photos. Um, and I found an article, I haven't had, you know, haven't researched this extensively, but I found an article that said that Evernote can do something like that. I know there are definitely scanning apps that are designed for business cards. And I think that an app that's designed to do text rec recognition from a business card would probably work on an address label. And, um, and, it, and it's the same flaw with everything. It recognizes most of it. It puts the then, data generally in the right place, but yeah. you do have to, you it won't just scan and, and, and you walk away. You're going to have to scan it and look at the file that it creates. Yeah. Typically make you sure have to it identify it. Yeah, here, this is the person's first name and this is the person's last name and this is their street address and all of that. And sometimes the graphics and the, you know, the text, um, the font that they use makes it really hard for the system to translate it or it'll pick up a number that it thinks is the phone number and it's some other number. And, you know, so you really have to, yes, there are ways to scan business cards and capture contact data, but they always require editing to make sure that it's accurate and, you know, 100% what you want. So they do exist. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the scanner that has that function in it. Neat scanner, maybe. I need to go look it up. Yeah. Um, but they, most of the scanners do have, you know, here, scan the business card thing that's supposed to create something that can be attached to contacts. And there's just a, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one transfer. You can look at however they graphically design the card and find the telephone number, but the scanner can't always do that. So you, it, it will reduce the amount of work that you have to do, but you will still have to go in and edit. It's not a perfect translation. Yeah. Neat scanner. Thank neat, you. Neat.com has a, has a business card scanner that will uh, do text recognition and capture the capture it to your contacts or outlook address book. Yeah, you just have to make sure that you check it before you declare it complete. Okay, um, next is you can shrink your volume of reading material by reading on your tablet, smartphone, smartphone or a dedicated e-reader like a Kindle or a Nook. Um, you can subscribe to magazines and newspapers on the e-readers as well as purchase and download ebooks. So just reading the magazines you like and your favorite newspaper online will eliminate a lot of paper. Somebody that has a newspaper subscription that comes every day means that they have to read the paper and then they have to go get the paper and recycling and people stack it up and it, you know, it's like a constant shoveling of the newspaper out the door. If you just subscribe to your favorite magazines and newspapers online, you will really reduce the volume of paper in your paper clutter in your house that requires constant vigilance to maintain otherwise. And we talked last week about buying ebooks or going through your library to borrow them. We mentioned Overdrive and Amazon.com, which provide one route for borrowing library ebooks. But a few YouTube, YouTube commenters pointed out that there are other apps and e-sharing resources in use. If you're not sure how to get library ebooks, the best starting point is to call your local library and find out what services they offer or apps that they recommend. Uh, worth the effort to try, if, especially if you are a prolific reader. Um, reading material is always a big backup. It's always a big clutter pile and it, you know, it starts its catalogs and it goes through magazines and newspapers and then goes to books and all that category of reading material generates clutter in the house. And so any one of those things that you can 
spin out to uh, electronic instead of paper will help uh, shrink your clutter maintenance of paper every week. Here's a good one. Instead of accumulating notes on scraps of paper or in a notebook, take notes and create to-do lists electronically on your laptop or your tablet or smartphone. There's lots of applications like Evernote for capturing and organizing notes and lists and synchronizing them among all the devices. So if paper note taking is your preferred method, at least do it all in one notebook. <laughs> so if you can do it electronically and switch to an electronic note taking solution, awesome. And if paper makes you happy, and you like to be able to get out the pen or pencil and write on a piece of paper, then at least convert yourself to one notebook and think of it as, think of it as it's necessary to carry it like you carry your phone. You keep track of your purse, you keep track of your phone and you have one notebook that you make all of the notes in your head that you write down in one place or another. I'm capturing this phone number. I'm capturing this a to-do list, I forgot, I love this quote, whatever you write down on little scraps of paper, uh, better to park it all in one notebook and then you will get rid of a whole bunch of little excess pieces of paper. It will keep you from losing that one scrap of paper with that one phone number that you wanna have. It'll always be in the notebook somewhere. Even if you it takes a while to find it, you'll know it's in the notebook and so Better to have all those random um, written down thoughts, comments, captures in one book and make, make the effort to carry the book around with you, to keep it in your purse when you leave the house, to make it accessible so that you don't just grab the next loose piece of paper and scribble on it and then sit that down. And then all those papers float around the house and they're all, they all have one important piece of data on them. So you never wanna throw them away because there's somebody's phone number and here's the address I needed and here's that website I was gonna look up and here's, and it, then you can never let yourself throw them away. So better to capture them and write it all in one place. And I actually convert people from scrap notes to a notebook by taking all the scraps instead of like rewriting them all. I'll just, you know, grab that note, trim it down and slap it into a page. I'll just tape it into a page <laughs> to capture the existing uh, important scraps of paper. And then, uh, then you can turn the page and start writing live in it after we get it set up. Worth the effort to free yourself from a million little pieces of paper. The last one that I have is that you can empty your pockets and purses and shopping bags of all those little receipts. You can keep the credit card receipt long enough to reconcile it against your account statement. You want to make sure that it got charged correctly. After that, and for most of the cash purchases that you make, there's no need to hold on to the receipts for items that you plan to keep. A notable exception, of course, is receipts that will document a business expense on your tax return, but those should be rerouted immediately to some kind of a folder or an envelope that's marked with the tax year so that they are out of your purse, they're off your kitchen counter, they're not lost, and they're available when it's time to do the taxes. So maintaining that paper regularly, once a week, fishing out of wherever you squirrel them away, whether it's the shopping bag that you reuse or your purse or the pockets of your jacket or your jeans or the wallet or whatever, going through and pulling all those receipts out and going, yeah, drank that coffee. I can throw this receipt away. <laughs> if it's, uh, you know, it's very obvious that a lot of the receipts that you get are for things that there's nothing for you to do about it now. So you're not going to return the food that you already ate, the coffee you already drank. You're not going to go back to the grocery store after you've had the food for a week, you're eating it or it's dead. Like that's it. So there's a whole lot of receipts that we get that we hesitate to throw away in the immediate moment, but I would you know, do them that night, do them that week, uh, do them as quickly as possible and subtract those things because they tend to accumulate and then the pile looks really, really valuable and it looks like it's super dense, full of stuff that 
must be important and then you start going through them all and there's like two receipts in there you care about so better to filter constantly and uh, on a regular basis as part of your maintenance routine to get all those if it can be thrown away throw it away if you're not sure save it for a week and look at it again next week but you know today that you went to office depot to buy supplies for your business and that that receipt needs to be in your tax return and so you can take today's receipt out and immediately go put it in a tax folder and then forget about it and it's not lost and you know that when you go to mcdonald's for lunch you can throw that receipt out because you're not going back to McDonald's that receipt to do anything with it. Unless so, you're entertaining your business client at McDonald's. <laughs> and then, but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole separate problem we need to talk to you about. <laughs> that's a whole nother show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anya asked, what recommendations do you have about digital clutter on e-readers? <laughs> I need you to elaborate on that. What do you mean? What is the did like you have too many books on there? Um, so lots of the e-readers basically have sort of an iCloud like they they save it to the cloud so you don't have to keep it on the reader if you don't want. You can punt it out to the you can punt it out to the cloud and then if you want to see that book again, it's still in your library and you can re-download it. Um, That's a good point. Right, and then maybe, if they're books that you read and you know you're not going to read again, then you can delete them. Yeah. What else do you have to say about that? Ed? You're much more I, of an e I don't know because on my iPad, I don't get my, I don't get my email on my iPad, which would, which I could imagine being a much bigger problem, but, but dedicated e-readers, you don't typically get your email on there either. I don't think. Um, so what was Alan's response there? I saw that she has to admit something, but I didn't catch it. Yes, too many books. Maybe I have to admit I don't have an e-reader yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So, and and what Gail said, uh, it it is less of a problem because your yeah your library of e-books is typically cloud based, and I it's one of the things I love about e-books. If I'm stuck somewhere, I don't typically keep books on my phone because it's too small to yeah. to read for any length of time but you can um you know if i'm if i get stuck somewhere i'm having to wait a long time i can i have the kindle app on there i can launch it go to my online library and say download this book for me and it even downloads it and it's synced to the page where i was reading last where you left off yeah, yeah it's just terrific well, and you know, in the early days of ebooks, they it all downloaded to the the device, and there were storage issues. And you know, we've we've evolved past that. There's there's way more. They have better storage capacity. They store stuff on the cloud. They don't, you know, so you can refresh and keep what's on your uh, on your device accessible and functioning for a lot through a whole lot more books than than when we first launched e-readers. So uh, they just keep getting better and better about managing the data for that. And you know, if you're a, a, a book addicted person, this is a way for you to have a really big library and not have it in your house. We're just saying. <laughs> um, re, uh, and Rejoice on Zoom pointed out that DMA Choice, which was one of the uh, resources we mentioned for direct marketing. Yeah, direct marketing, yeah. They also offer options for do not contact for caregivers and do not contact for the deceased. Oh, so you really? Can go, yeah, so you can go in there and you know notify them that someone has passed away and make the flood of mail stop so that if you're the poor soul having to manage that after the death of a loved one, you it know, is such a relief. stop the flood. Because it makes people so sad to get stuff addressed to their deceased person a year later, and you're still getting mail addressed to somebody that's dead. I had a client who's um, elderly, and her husband died, and she keeps getting mail from one particular company, and it just offends her to no end. And she calls them, and she's like, "This man is dead. I'm not. He's not going to answer you. It's 
<laughs> you can tell that it just pokes her button so hard. And I've been there while she's been, been making that phone call again to yell at them about my husband is deceased and stop sending. And you can tell it's just like, please leave me alone. She's just begging for them to leave her alone. And I can't imagine anything that you can do to make that go away. It would be so, such a relief to people who are already grieving. And like I said, you know, this is that whole, you, you, you get mail every day of your life and it keeps coming for three months after you're dead. Like it's just mail is insidious and it's paper and you have to do everything you can to release it and 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 thin it out and so these are all ways that hopefully will make what comes in the mailbox thinner and able to be coped with in a more maintenance mode that's the goal here today um eileen said i pay bills online mostly but use auto pay sparingly I once had a company that hit my debit card twice and through the domino effect, it caused my rent check to bounce. What a mess. Oh, that's and a that's, bummer. And that's why we, I kind of preface that with if you're comfortable with it and if you have the, the resources because it, it can be, a, it can be dangerous. You, you can kind of get yourself stuck and in that situation where the overdraft charge throws you deeper into overdraft and all of that yeah, I, and yeah. I think my general advice to someone who's starting you know trying to get set up to use auto pay is if your bank or credit union supports it connect your checking account to overdraft either to a savings account or to a line of credit if you if, you, if that's available to you so that you are you you're at least somewhat protected against that domino effect yeah you don't get trapped cascading and charges the other thing too is that you can um so some people can you can go into a company like i can go to the electric company and pay them directly through their website or you can go to your own bank and set up bill paying services in your own bank and then you sort of pre load those people and say and then you go to the bank and say send them money and so you trigger the payment instead of the actual company you're paying triggering the payment right you're pushing and, it rather than pulling it yes yeah. exactly and so then you know that you've sent the payment instead of having some it, it eliminates the possibility of them sucking money twice because and, you're right. going to set it off at the at the bill paying app in at your own bank in your bank and if you're instead yeah yeah and if you're and you can set up auto pay through your bank and if you're if it's if it's not going to work they're going to notify they won't you send it. they're not yeah, going to yeah, yeah. send it and send you into overdraft um yeah so that's a way to to sort of uh, make that a little bit safer there's a lot of uh chat today about bullet journals as a way to consolidate a lot of stuff yeah, into a single capture notebook. all those notes right have you have you ever done it i have not done it and actually i just bought a book to look into it because i find it uh, it's an interesting intersection between crafting and uh data management <laughs> it's, because it's it's designed to be it was designed by somebody the concept was designed by somebody who actually has add and so he found that this is a way that worked for him to capture data and keep up with it and so um it's if you have add i think it is a, a process that works well and it's designed to be creative as well so you can you're making your own pages and you can be decorative and it can be embellished and you can use all different color pins and you can use stickers and it's you know it's a it's a way to capture data in in bullet point form and keep a calendar there and keep to-do list there and keep note taking there and all kinds of stuff. And so um, it's turned into, I mean, he designed and wrote this concept and apparently it blew up like he had no idea and it just took off. So if you go and Google about bullet journals, you will see all kinds of stuff. You'll see the guy's original book. Sorry, I can't tell you what his name is right off the bat. And, and then a million books that have written, been written since about it and all kinds of articles talking about it like you can deep dive into that as a solution and and like i said i really um 
because he was ADD and he designed this as a way for him to be more productive and to keep up with his stuff better. Um, I think it will lend itself to uh, ADD people really well. Be worth the exploration if you have a struggle in that area about keeping up with that kind of stuff. He found it made him a whole lot more productive and totally worth it. Kara asked, how do you set up an easy file system for papers that you do keep? If there were just a few files, what would they be? Tax papers, a file of account numbers, medical, what? And Gail, what is your maintenance schedule and what does it look like? That's an that's a sort of a question we've spent entire meetings <laughs> talking, talking about. about. So the short answer, so there's two questions areas there, and one of them is file categories. And so um, generally you want big buckets instead of a bunch of little ones. Uh, it makes it easier to manage. And everybody has stuff related to their profession, stuff related to their house, stuff related to their finances and investments. And so wherever you're living, Either you have a lease and you have repairs related to the, the place where you lease, or you own a house and you have repairs and maintenance related to the house, um, then you're going to have um, financial stuff, investment or banking, that kind of data. You're going to have credit card data, that kind of, those kind of statements, um, things that are related to taxes. So that's a big bucket. And then depending on your uh, age and health, you may or may not have a big uh, medical file, big medical bucket that has, you know, some people see a million doctors, they take a bunch of meds, they've had a bunch of surgeries, they've had a bunch of illnesses. And, you know, that category of medical records can be huge. Or somebody who's relatively healthy and doesn't have a lot of issues, you may have a couple of little pieces of paper related to medical records. So let me make that list again. So finances, medical records, stuff related to your home or apartment, stuff related to your work. So occasionally you'll have things like you have a contract for the job that you're in or you signed a, a bunch of paperwork or you got I'm a new employee at this company, and so here's all of my new employee documentation. You may have some paperwork that supports your interaction with your job, and so that might be a category to have. Um, keepsakes is always a big one, but I don't typically put those in files because keepsakes are usually a bigger volume than will make sense in a file cabinet, but it is a category of paper that you want to keep up with, and you want um, keepsakes to be separated from the rest of your paper because they just sort of clog the works <laughs> you know photos and letters and stuff that are personal in nature and you're saving just because they're a keepsake just uh, jam up and make the paper look more cluttered the other part of that question was your maintenance how often system. do I, yeah, yeah how often do i maintain them so basically i pull the mail every day and go through the mail and throw out what's not going to stay um, bills go into a, I just have a little expandable folder thing that I put bills in until I go to pay them. Um, once I, I sit down for a bill paying session and I will pay bills online or do, do that kind of stuff. I'll make notes about what I've done onto the piece of paper and I will take that piece of paper and go file it. Some of them are, um, uh, clutter fair related and some, uh, so my business documentation and some of it's personal and I just have two little buckets over here that have two little labels on them business and personal and I just throw those papers into that bucket for the year uh, that way everything that I paid is in a stack and I go through occasionally you know once a quarter once every six months and I pull out stuff and go okay here's a stack of things I'm ready to shred here's a stack of things that I think um, are tax related personally and pull them out and, um, and then the whole clutter fairy bucket is all tax related because it's all business expense. So every, everything that I spend on clutter fairy uh, becomes source documentation for the tax return. Um, what else do I do? At some point at the end of the year, I will go and go through those buckets and um, pull them out, file the tax stuff with the tax collection that I'm gonna do the tax return from or send to, I'm gonna scan and send to the tax accountant. 
and then um, I try to shred everything that I don't think I'm going to need to keep. There's other papers that come in like, you know, things related to the house, things that I bought, my medical records, my credit card stuff. I have a, a file box, uh, like an inbox, and I go and stack those things in an inbox as well next to my, my receipt buckets. And um, that inbox can only hold about, you know, four inches of paper before it's, it hits the, it's next to the, it's underneath the shelf. And so at four inches, it hits the shelf and I'm stuck. So it forces me to go in and then pull that box down and go file things. And so I tend to file things, you know, five or six times a year and get rid of a chunk and go put things away because I would rather sit for a couple of hours, sort some paper, put all of these things related to medical away, put all these things related to uh, banking away, put all these, you see what I'm saying? So I would rather batch process the paper for filing than filing it one at a time. And I'm able to stay on top of it. I don't, like I said, it hits the wall. Once I get that tall, I, I'm, you can't, I can't put any more on the inbox. I gotta go file. So I have sort of a back end shutdown that won't let me go beyond uh, several months before it gets too crowded. So um, if you're not good at circling back and sitting down with the files or you wait until the inbox or the stack of paper that needs to be filed is three feet high, then you can't sit down in the afternoon and accomplish the task. You're looking at hours and hours of filing. So it's better, <laughs> it's better to do it more frequently. And if you don't do that well to do it all the time, like when you get the three pieces of paper in the mail that you wanna save, and uh, they need to be filed that you stop and go file them right then. Uh, totally a personal preference and you know, ability to attach concept, you know, <laughs> whether, you, whether you can stay focused on it and get it done or whether you're okay with coming back and doing it later. Um, what else about paper do I do? Does that answer the question? I think that covers most of the paper. I think it I'm does. I'm really good about receipts. I, you know, when I get, when I buy something and it goes, the receipt goes in the trash with the food, the, you know, if I think it's an important receipt, it goes in my purse and it comes out really frequently. I don't carry around a lot of paper in my purse. I'm not one of those people that shoves it in there and leaves it there for six months. I'm constantly taking it out because it annoys me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm really good about retrieving the receipts. Okay. Does that answer it? Sorry. I think so. We're running out of time. I'm, okay. So I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements and then I'll come back to you for some final thoughts. Okay. I want to remind viewers and listeners who are with us live that our YouTube channel has more than a hundred videos on a wide variety of organizing topics. Go to cfhou.com slash YouTube and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel on YouTube and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you'd like to get notifications whenever we post something new. Our next meeting is next Tuesday, September 1st at noon central time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. Assuming and, we haven't blown away yet. Right. We're going to launch a series called A Decluttering Philosophy, Changing Our Relationship to Stuff. Over the next several weeks, we're going to examine our relationship with stuff from several different angles, positive and negative emotions, habits and behaviors, ethical and social questions. Throughout the series, we're going to focus on awareness of the various components of our relationships with stuff. And at the end of the series, we're going to talk about practical approaches to bring our spaces into better alignment with who we are and the lives we want to live. If you are watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. Okay, Gail, final thoughts on paperlessness. Final thoughts on paperlessness. Okay, so... The first final thought is remember that concept that we mentioned a few weeks ago called successive approximation. There, this is the notion that a little better is still better. So even if you're not ready to implement all these suggestions, trying a few of them will help. Try one of the tactics and when you start to see the difference in volume of paper that you're having to process, you might decide that you want to try some more. The second thought is don't waste time and effort digitizing paper that serves no purpose. 
if you've had a long habit of keeping too much paper, it can feel risky to trash, shred, or recycle anything. But trust me when I say that you will never need that receipt for a Frappuccino or proof that you paid the water bill 10 years ago. Just let them go. And finally, what we're ultimately going for here is to lighten your workload. Remove the visual distraction of piles of unmanaged paper and reduce your level of anxiety. So my last suggestion today is this, don't overthink it. If you're struggling with the decision about whether to keep, toss, or digitize a particular piece or category of paper, take the option that feels safest to you. You can always change your mind later. And in the meantime, no one is going to judge you for not being perfectly paperless. If you have to keep it, keep it for now and try to make decisions about something else. And nobody's going to judge you about it. And we're always going to be here to help. Please come back. <laughs> and as always, we love to hear from you. So please keep your questions and topic suggestions coming in the YouTube comments and on Facebook and so forth. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Thanks everybody. We are so glad to see you and we will see you again next week. And, you know, think good thoughts that I don't, uh, you know, fly away in the hurricane this week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.